Um, I'm also joined by Nikki Wells, by the way. Um, give her a round of applause. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, something that I find very interesting, which is uh, hopefully going to come up on that screen in a minute. Um, there were two people that uh, I was amazed to find out actually got together in 1930 in uh, Berlin for two conversations, and one of which was um, Albert Einstein and also Rabindranath Tagore. And I was incredulous because these two people came from such different backgrounds. And uh, they talked when they met about everything from uh, physics and philosophy and art and music and existentialism. But mainly, I'm going to talk about their relationship to music. So just to give you a bit of background, um, Rabindranath Tagore was a Bengali Renaissance man. He, um, he was very famous for, um, for being a great polymath of the East. He was an Indian polymath, prolific poet, playwright, songwriter, and painter. He also very famously got given the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913 for this collection of poems called Gitanjali, or Gitanjali, I think. And um, he was also, uh, after that, knighted by the uh, by George V in 1915, and then subsequently returned it after the uh, Amritsar massacre of 1919. So that's just a little bit about uh, Rabindranath Tagore. The other person is probably better known well, across the world, and his name is Albert Einstein. And he uh, was, of course, the genius German originator of relativity. He was in search of the ultimate equation and he wanted to know the mind of God. He believed that he could actually really understand uh, the makings and the workings of the universe. He, more than any other uh, human being, probably of the 20th and 21st centuries, actually single-handedly defined the concept of genius. Um, and he also was trying to figure out, um, I suppose, how you could actually unite every single theory going and explain the universe. So what? Do you think the first thing was that they said to each other when these two amazing giants of the East and the West met? Well, it might not have been exactly what you might imagine. Uh, the first thing that actually was said to them, uh, said to, uh, said was uh, by Rabindranath Tagore, and he came up with this interesting opening shot to Albert Einstein, which was where he said, I was discussing with Dr. Mendel today the new mathematical discoveries which tell us that in the realm of infinitesimal atoms, chance has its play. The drama of existence is not predetermined in character, which probably would have been quite <laughs> a surprise to hear the first thing that, you, uh, that someone says when you walk in the door. Um, so um, Einstein would have particularly focused on these four words, chance has its play. And... Um, the reason he would have focused on those was because he thought that those acquainted, uh, chance equate, equated with uh, quantum theory, and particularly with uncertainty. Uh, physicists will know that uh, the uncertainty principle from Heisenberg, the quantum physicist, was that uh, the position and momentum of a particle couldn't be known simultaneously. Um, so he, he felt uh, very uncomfortable with that notion and, and with quantum physics as a whole. Um, as he said, God doesn't play dice. He didn't believe in random occurrences and the quantum weirdness uh, didn't really work in his mind. It might have uh, put him out of a job and left him looking for other work. So, um, so just to kind of uh, move on from that, he, he actually uh, looked at the idea of, he postulated the idea of an elegant universe where everything, absolutely everything, could be explained. And he tried to do that through uh, sim uh, simply through equations. And of course, he came up with the most famous equation of all time, where he uh, uh, equated um, energy, uh, he equated the energy of the universe with mass times the speed of light squared. So um, he, he believed in this idea of universal truths. That's what he was looking for in equations. And he wanted a universal truth that could explain everything. So. If we go to Tagore now and, and look at the way he, he thought about it, the concept of universal truth, um, he took a very different kind of approach to that. I won't read you the whole of this, but uh, he said, truth, which is one with the universal being, must be essentially human. He was a humanist. Uh, it was uh, in the same way the Italian Renaissance was a humanist movement, so was the Bengali Renaissance. He said, otherwise, whatever we individuals realize as true never can be called truth. So essentially, what he was talking about was subjectivity based on ancient Eastern philosophy. 
Um, Einstein, on the other hand, uh, in the same conversation with, uh, with Tagore, he, he talked about a hypothetical table in a house and said, if nobody were in the house, the table would exist all the same, but this is uh, already illegitimate from your point of view because we can't explain what it means that the table is there independently of us. So here he's talking about objectivity based on Western science. So how does this all relate to, uh, to music? Well, um, it's quite interesting because, first of all, I didn't know this until, uh, until a couple of years ago, that Einstein was a great classical violinist. And uh, he'd studied violin from the age of five. And in fact, in his latter life, uh, he went on to be, um, to be the vice president of Princeton University uh, Symphony Orchestra, or Princeton uh, Symphony Orchestra, uh, between 1952 to 1955. So he was quite an accomplished musician, and he gave numerous performances. And it was said of him, uh, that uh, Einstein relished Mozart, noting to a friend that it was as if the great Wolfgang Amadeus did not create his beautifully clear music at all, but simply discovered it already made. This perspective parallels remarkably Einstein views, Einstein's views on the ultimate simplicity of nature and its explanation and statement via essentially simple mathematical expressions. And you can break that down into two different ideas. Um, the first of which is that he thought of music as an, having an objective aesthetic that existed beyond human perception, that it was not created. And secondly, that it had a mathematical simplicity and it had a structure and it could be ordered and knowable. So the first idea actually coincided a lot with the way in which Tagore thought about the universe. He believed in a universal spirit and this idea of something greater than ourselves being out there that we could tap into. So if we take that first idea, and uh, we look at it, we could look at um, the mathematician Johannes Kepler, who, in, uh, who was a 16th and 17th century mathematician who followed in the footsteps of Pythagoras, who'd written this book called The Music of the Spheres. And Kepler, um, Kepler went on to write a book called Harmonices Mundi, where he said that the harmonic, harmonic resonance of orbiting planets is intrinsically mu musical. So he thought that uh, there was a universal musicality, uh, again, that, that was out there and was intrinsic in the way everything worked. Now, the person you're looking at is uh, the late great Pandit, uh, Pandit G. Ravi Shankar, who passed away last year, and who I happened and I was privileged to know. And he once said to me that a musician is a medium through which the rag manifests. Um, I find that quite interesting because uh, it's this notion that you don't create the music yourself, you don't play it yourself, uh, it's, it's something that you tap into and you gradually expose it. Which I, um, I, and, and the idea of the rag, just to explain a little bit about what a rag is, a rag is a series of notes, it's up to seven notes, uh, it can, it's an exploration of melody, of melodic structure, and it can, uh, it can represent times of day, the seasons, different moods, different colours, um, rags are uh, v very variable and you can have them, you can equate them to some degree with modes in Western music, but they, they differ in lots of other ways. Um, and he also said of Tagore, who actually met once, that he was like the sun. So um, Tagore himself was a prolific musician. He, he wrote in his lifetime 2,000 songs, um, some of which were influenced also by Celtic music as well. Um, a fantastic uh, body of work, and, and all those songs are still performed, many of them still perform today in India and across the world. So um, he also said that uh, a very beautiful quote from him was, music fills the infinite between two souls. So if we look at uh, Albert Einstein here, we've got a person who thinks of music in a very objective way. Uh, he, he doesn't really uh, engage with the idea of creativity. Wow, I, I didn't know I could do that, but uh, <laughs> amazing. Um, so um, he, he, he really kind of believed in the idea that uh, the music was already out. You tapped into it. <laughs> Excuse me, it's something like that. Um, and, um, and Tagore uh, believed in the idea of, he was quite intuitive, and he believed in the idea that you, could, uh, that you should think of music in a much more subjective way. So uh, two people that I really admired who actually uh, worked together and collaborated in the 20th century who came from those respective backgrounds were Yehudi Menuhin, 
who was a fantastic, as most people know, a fantastic classical violinist and also uh, one of my heroes, the great uh, Panditji Ravi Shankar. And uh, they, they really made it work. Um, they really brought together those two, two traditions and it was a beautiful uh, uh, kind of, I wouldn't use the word fusion because I'm not too fond of it, but it was a great synergy that they, that they had. So let's look at the differences between uh, Western classical music and Indian classical music. In Western classical music, it's a written tradition. It's rich in harmony. It's rich in melody. It has simpler rhythm. Um, you have 4-4, four, 6-8, four, 3-4 time. They're, they're the most commonly used time signatures. Um, and it's objective. It's set in structure. Um, it has set composition to it. And it has a lot of certainty. Um, even the dynamics of written music uh, are are set, so, so even interpretation of the music is, is dictated to by the sheet music itself. With Indian classical music, it comes from an oral tradition. It's simple in harmony. It's rich in melody. It's rich in rhythm. Uh, you have many time signatures um, in 11-beat in cycles, 17-beat cycles, 12-beat cycles, and so on. It's, uh, it can be much more complex. And it's subjective. It uses a lot of mathematics in the uh, rhythms as well. Oh, right. Oh, it's no one heard me the whole time. <laughs> anyway, shall I start again? Um, so, um, so it's it's much more subjective. Oh, this is great, isn't it? Um, and uh, I can hear myself now. Fantastic. Um, and it's uh, much more interpretive in structure. It has um, spontaneous creativity. It's largely improvised, and there's a lot of uncertainty, much like this. Uh, this mic I'm wearing. Um, and it's um, it's also. Um, it's also kind of, uh, the reason it's uncertain particularly is because each time you perform an Indian classical piece of music, it's totally different and it varies a lot. So um, actually to give you a demonstration of those two different things, we can bring in, <laughs> the person I'm obscuring totally, uh, is Nikki Wells. And um, she's going to sing for us, first of all, uh, Panis, uh, Panis Angelicus, uh, followed by uh, the Indian classical Rag, rag Bhairavi. Nikki Wells. I'm trying to click on this hat, right? <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> so, uh, trying to click off this. Great. Um, so let's come back to Einstein. He, he actually said that music, um, like the, hit, well, as we know, he said music like the universe is a puzzle to be solved, which is pretty much his approach to everything. Um, and he actually said in conversation with Tagore, we want to know whether Western music is a conventional or a fundamental human feeling, whether to feel consonance or dissonance is natural or a convention which we accept. So um, Tagore thought in a very different way. He didn't think in terms of music to be uh, solved as a, as a puzzle. He thought of it as a painter, um, that music was like a painting to be expressed. And he said... Melody and harmony are like lines and colors in pictures. A simple linear picture may be completely beautiful. The introduction of color may make it vague and insignificant, yet color may, by combination with lines, create great pictures. So you've got these very different approaches to, uh, to music, and uh, his approach there was very poetic, which is a shame, because um, Einstein absolutely hated poetry. Uh, he hated most things that were 
that were creative um, in the arts, and in fact, he really, um, really didn't like Beethoven very much for similar reasons. He thought he was way too creative and too unpredictable as a result, probably pretty much in the same way that he thought Heisenberg's creativity with the uncertainty principle wasn't great either. That's probably how he looked at him. Um, so um, the reason partially for this, I think, is because of the uh, the fact that he lived in Einst uh, he lived in Berlin, which was uh, during well, actually it was two years before the Bauhaus um, school was there. Uh, the Bauhaus school before that was in Weimar and then Dessau, um, and it was a it was a movement of structured thinking. It was a, it was very ordered. It was about um, and that came through the architecture and the art and and the design. Uh, of the Bauhaus movement. I think that was the Berlin that, uh, that Einstein occupied and that probably fed into his way of looking at everything. Um, Tagore was a much more intuitive person. He said, um, uh, and this kind of smacks of unrequited love, he said, I spent my days stringing and unstringing my instrument while the song I came to sing remains unsung. And he, he spent pretty much his life, um, in terms of unrequited love, writing songs haunted by the ghost of a woman who committed suicide over him. And, the, and uh, she was actually his sister-in-law. Um, he, when he married two months later, she actually uh, she took her own life. And uh, he was haunted by her for the rest of his life. Another fact about him is, uh, although he hated nationality, uh, Tagore actually inadvertently wrote the unofficial national anthem of India, which became that after his death. <laughs> Vindhya Himachal Yamuna Ganga Uttara Chalatrik Ranga Thank you. <laughs> so just coming back to um, Tagore's original uh, statement to uh, Einstein, it seems a bit, a bit full on and a bit crazy, but actually it does refer to quantum physics, and it's likely that Tagore did know quite a bit about quantum physics, not just through their mutual friend, Dr. Mendel, but also through uh, another member of the uh, Bengali race, Renaissance, or another part of, uh, person from that movement, um, and his name was Satyan Bosch, who actually came up with the Bosch-Einstein condensate with Einstein, and who also um, is the person after whom the uh, boson is named. So. Um, this, uh, these four words, again, chance has its play. Um, I was quite interested in that phrase because for me, as a musician, I've always thought that um, it's the other way around. Uh, I'll try and spin that in. And that's um, that play, as a musician, stimulates chance. And just to give you an, an, uh, an example of that, when I was um, years ago, it's quite weird. I mean, I've had lots of coincidences in my, in my life and career as a musician. And many years ago, I was... Um, I was living in this shared house and I had three flatmates. One guy was called Iqbal, another guy Hitesh, and another guy called Sanj. And, um, and I remember I was looking for a tabla player. Tabla is an Indian classical percussion instrument. And I was looking for a tabla player to play a gig with me the following week. And um, I couldn't find anyone. And I remember ringing up my mum because I remember asking her about this kid who I'd jammed with when he was about 11 years old in this house. Fantastic tabla player. And I was about 17 and I was playing flamenco guitar with him and he was playing beautifully on the tabla, and I just wondered what happened to him. He, he must still be pretty good. So, um, so she actually went to see if she could find him, and eventually she sent me a letter uh, that she, had unop she hadn't opened, um, and uh, it was just forwarded to me. So I opened it up in the living room in front of my three flatmates, and I was surprised to see that the, uh, the address inside was my address. So I, <laughs> I turned around to Iqbal and said, um, so when you were 11, did you actually uh, jam with this guy uh, where you were playing tabla and he was playing uh, the guitar? And he said, that was you? So it's kind of, uh, so, so I suppose, um, I mean, I've had lots of situations like that, but I kind of ultimately think um, that that is pretty odd. And I guess maybe that's some of the things that people have been referring today uh, in some of their speeches about some of the quantum weirdness. And I guess um, 
in, in reflection on this conversation between Einstein and Tagore, ultimately I do agree with um, Albert Einstein that there is something greater out there. Um, and I think Tagore also agreed with that as well, something that you tap into as a musician when you're playing or improvising or working. But I also think uh, with Tagore that... Um, that there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of chance in the way everything works, and that doesn't just uh, happen in the in the quantum world. I think uh, somehow that feeds its way into the musical world. And uh, the more I play music, the more uh, coincidences I find happen in my life. Anyway, thank you very much for that. Cheers, Nicky Wells.